here's yet another one of my heroes. Don Dutton is uh, one of the pioneers in uh, the field of domestic violence and has been for many years. And uh, I'm just you know, really pleased to have him here today. Um, he received his PhD in psychology from the University of Toronto in 1970. After receiving training as a group therapist at Cold Mountain Institute, Don co-founded the Assaultive Husbands Project in 1979, a court-mandated treatment program for men convicted of wife assault. He has published more than 100 papers, probably 200 by now, and several books, including The Domestic Assault of Women, The Batterer, A Psychological Profile, and The Abusive Personality, published initially uh, in 1998, I, I believe, and now uh, in 2002. The batterer has been translated into French, Spanish, Dutch, Japanese, and Polish, and Don has frequently served as an expert witness in civil trials involving domestic abuse and in criminal trials involving family violence. He is currently professor of psychology at the University of British Columbia. His latest work, Rethinking Domestic Violence, includes an examination of how the gender paradigm developed in domestic violence research and policy. <laughs> By the way, if, you w if you're looking for one book to buy, uh, as much as I'd like you to buy mine. Uh, <laughs> Rethinking Domestic Violence is the best book that's ever been written on the subject, in my view. Uh, his other recent books include a, recent, a review of recent research on personality disorder, developmental neuroscience, and intimate abusiveness, and an explanation in the psychology of genocide and military massacres. I want to introduce Don Dutton. <laughs> Thanks, John. And yeah, w the material we're going to talk about today is going to come primarily from Rethinking Domestic Violence, and it's sort of a focus on uh, how the social science involved in domestic violence got twisted the way it did, because I grew up with a social science model where the evidence was provided and you treated that with respect and moved on from there, and of course something else has been happening. <laughs> And so it's the title here is Bias Assimilation, Bel Belief, Perseverance, and Groupthink. These are all social psychological phenomena that uh, I'll try to explain as we go through this and look at some of the things that have gone on in the domestic violence uh, literature. Uh, <coughs> I take this back to Francis Bacon, um, who had this quote, human understanding, when it's adopted an opinion, draws all things else as support and agree with it. Though there may be a greater number and weight of instances to be found on the other side, Yet these it either neglects and despises, or else by some distinction sets aside and rejects, in order that by this great and pernicious predetermination, the authority of its former conclusion may remain inviolate. Uh, a lot of social psychologists made their entire career doing empirical research to prove this particular quote from Francis Bacon's Novum Morganum. Um, now, there's something called the Woozel effect that goes on, that uh, a term that uh, Richard Gellis and Murray Strauss uh, cited originally the woozel came, uh, uh, it's a fictional beast where the, the, there's footsteps that are made and they're made by the people who are looking for the woozel and they decide that the woozel must exist because they found these footsteps. And you, you find this kind of thing going on to a certain extent in family violence. It goes back to this uh, uh, book that Langley and Levy wrote in 1977, Wife Beating the Silent Crisis, when they reported half the women in the U.S. were abused and cited a study by Gallus and Strauss as the basis for this uh, extra inappropriately extrapolated statistic. Um, but the study that Gallus and Strauss talked about had been conducted in a shelter, okay? And they generalized this to the entire population. You'll see this goes on quite a bit where there's entire generalizations from men in treatment groups to all men or from women in shelters to all women. In 1980 in Canada, Linda McLeod published a book called White battering in Canada, the vicious cycle, and said that one, every year, one in 10 Canadian women in a relationship were battered, and there hadn't been a survey done for another 20 years, okay? And actually, the statistic was lower than that. Um, <coughs> uh, Arias et al. quoted uh, Stetz and Strauss, we'll look at the Stetz and Strauss study in a minute, as a source saying that women were seven to 14 times more likely to report that intimate partners had beaten them up, choked them, threaten them with weapons or attempted to drown them. We'll look at the Stetson Strauss study. It says no such thing. There isn't an action by action analysis reported in that study, and they concluded that male and female violence rates were pretty close. Um, Neil Jacobson went on Oprah Winfrey's show years ago to sell his book, When Men Batter Women, 
said there are two kinds of male abusers, cobras and pit bulls. We'll look at that study as well. It turns out 40% of the women involved in that study committed severe domestic violence. That was not reported. Uh, the American Bar Association website says 85% of perpetrators are male. The American psychologist uh, allowed an unreferenced citation in 2006 that said more than 95% of abuse perpetrators are male. These things, of course, come from criminal justice statistics and do not take into account the fact that there's a selection factor. Um, and so this is what we refer to as the paradigm, the gender paradigm, that <coughs> all intimate partner violence is male, perpetrated 95%. It's also considered to be normative by people like Dobash and Dobash. Uh, it's uh, committed to sustain male domination in a society and that female intimate partner violence is in self-defense or it's a preemptive strike because they know that battering is about to occur and it's, so it still originates in a, with a male history of abuse. Um, this is their Dobash and Dobash site on it. Men who actually assault their wives are living up to a cultural prescription cherished in Western society. Aggressiveness, male dominance, and female subordination, uh, they're using physical force as a means to enforce that dominance. Of course, John Archer and others have also shown that protection of women is one of the things that got left off the list here. Um, so it's a little bit incomplete. Also, there's a question about whether this really is a norm or not. So all male battering then is conceptualized as power and control. We've all seen the power and control wheel. It's instrumental violence. It's done to commit, to create some kind of special outcome. Uh, female violence is self-defensive, so couples therapy is ruled out as being too dangerous for women. Uh, male violence will escalate if it's left unchecked. Uh, actually, uh, Feldenstrauss did a study that found that that wasn't true. There are more cases that de-escalated than escalated. And they went back and checked on a survey data that they'd done in 1985. Um, <clears throat> so males need to be more accountable. The male violence is normal violence. So therapy is not warranted. You just have interventions. Um, <clears throat> and it focuses on the confrontation of sexist beliefs which cause violence and male privilege. That means that psychological causes of intimate partner violence are all of them are considered to be excuses and are ruled out by law in some states, including my favorite, the state of Georgia, where I've been banned for life, um, <laughs> along with Ray Charles. Uh, all, all forms of couples interaction causes are blaming the victim, uh, according to this uh, point of view. And, you know, Murray, always, Murray for, fortunately, has taken my name off the Canadian studies that collected uh, data on male and female violence and only reported the male violence. I, I, would plead, I plead guilty to that. That was a 1986 study. I succumbed to peer pressure. Fortunately, later on, I had female colleagues who gave me peer pressure to publish the female violence data, so they got published 10 years later. But here we have <coughs> the other side of it. Um, uh, Elo and Strauss talking about feminist sociology. And Murray said he, for a long time he thought of himself, still does as a feminist. Uh, Linda Mills was uh, nice enough to call Rethinking Domestic Violence a feminist tract. I thought that was pretty interesting. Sure, it's feminism. Women can do whatever men can do, including strike. Um, so the focus on male violence in general uh, towards women is the focus here. Patriarchy is male violence is normal control. There's an emphasis on gender relations and power, and this is Mo Michelle Bograd's uh, quote on this. All feminist researchers, clinicians, and activists address a primary question, why do men beat their wives? That's the way the question's phrased. Um, <clears throat> why men in general use physical force against their partners, and what functions this serves in a given society? Uh, <clears throat> and here's a, a quote from the Duluth Manual. Um, which I've been on record as opposing Duluth. Anyway, here's a quote. Using slavery, a colonial relationship, or an oppressively structured workplace as an example, the facilitator can draw a picture of the consciousness of domination. Um, and that's from page 49 of the Duluth model. So that pretty much gives you the flavor of this <coughs> black and white uh, view of relationships. And this, I think, is a very important quote, because it really kind of goes to, I, I see this as a sort of central organizing belief, this whole notion about male violence and female violence. Catherine McKinnon's book, Towards a Feminist Theory of State, says sexuality is to feminism what work is to Marxism. 
the molding, direction, and expression of sexuality organizes society into <coughs> two sexes, women and men. This division underlies the totality of social relations. So now we're going to take an economic model and map it on to a multi-layered and complex intimate relationship and say they're the same thing, which gets rid of all these <coughs> psychological issues like attachment, uh, inability to regulate uh, emotion, uh, attachment-related emotions, et cetera. They all go out the window because it's now uh, equated to uh, an economic relationship. So I think this is really important in terms of uh, a, being a central belief. Central beliefs are beliefs that can pull like a magnet a lot of other beliefs to them. And this is uh, one of the central ones in, in my view. And this is summarized here by Ken Corbo. He's not actually advocating this statement, but he's summarizing the view that <coughs> battering by males has never provoked hereditary out of control accidental or an isolated incident, it's not caused by disease, diminished intellect, alcoholism, addiction, mental illness, any external person or event. It's attributed specifically to the traits in that person. The traits include their normative beliefs in the society, um, as opposed to the view of female violence, which is attributed to something external. Um, <clears throat> it's a means for men to systematically dominate, disempower, control, and devalue women. It's greater than an individual act. It supports a larger goal of oppression of women. Now, uh, there was, in fact, a study done by Simon et al. Uh, right here. Um, large survey, 5,238 people. Asked them the question, <coughs> is, is it OK to hit your wife to keep her in line? Only 2% of men in North America agreed with that statement. So, uh, you know, I don't know what a normative belief is, but I know it's probably got to be more than 2%, right? 6% of people believe they were abducted by a UFO. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, most marriages are actually not patriarchal. Only 9.4% of North American marriages are male dominant, according to a study by Kuhlman and Strauss. Um, so, there's some buts that get raised here. Violence rates in victim surveys using the CTS show equivalent levels of violence, roughly equivalent. This is true even when the level of severity is assessed, Stetson Strauss, what I think is one of the, the major papers that ever published because it broke everything down by level of violence and gender that uh, Jan Stetson Murray Strauss did originally in 1989. And in younger age samples, female violence is on the rise. So we look at some of the, we'll look at some of the work by Whitaker, Morris, and Deborah Capaldi. Um, and, of course, the argument here has been, well, these CTS surveys take the violence out of context. You know, I think, as Murray said yesterday, uh, context is sort of a, a code word for excuses. Um, but the contextual patterns of domination are still exclusively male. Uh, however, <coughs> when you take look at studies that focus on this context, like control and motives for intimate partner violence, when these things are measured, the differences are not so black and wh uh, white. We'll look at, in fact, a survey that uh, survey data that uh, Denis Laroche uh, analyzed the data uh, uh, working for the government of Quebec, where he built an instrumentality uh, onto the Canadian General Social Survey and found the differences were not as black and white <coughs> as depicted. Back in 1994. Uh, I was raising some questions about this, saying, well, what about same-sex uh, violence? It's still intimate violence. And this is a study that Guanyat Lee did in Phoenix, um, <coughs> uh, where she had lesbians reporting on past relationships with women and with men, and reporting higher uh, abuse rates in their relationships with women, <coughs> um, indicating that intimacy was probably something that was important here in intimate relationships, not just gender, since you took gender out of this equation. And it wasn't the stereotypic belief that one lesbian would play a male role was not supported by that particular study. So with <coughs> all of these contradictory bits of data coming in, why does the paradigm persevere? Well, and there was a study done at Stanford back in 1979. Uh, Ross Lord, uh, Mark Lepper, Lee Ross, and they found that when you present research that contradicts somebody's beliefs, um, uh, people will find methodological flaws with that research. They did it in the context of presenting a study that either showed that capital punishment deterred violence or it didn't deter violence. And they gave it to groups of people who had pre-existing beliefs about deterrence. <coughs> the ones who 
believed that deterrence worked were very critical of the methodology of studies that said it didn't work, even though the methodology is the same in all these studies they're reading. The ones who believe capital punishment did work were, were critical of studies that found in the opposite direction. So we go after the methodology if we don't like the results, is the bottom line of what they found. And of course, this is one of the things that's happened with <coughs> the CTS, uh, even though it's probably the best instrument we have. Murray and I uh, co-presented back in 1999 uh, at a, uh, a conference in California, and at that point he was showing that the CTS picks up 16 times as much violence as the crime victim surveys. It's 16 times more sensitive. So you get s women reporting 16 times more violence with the CTS. So why is it not favored? Because it shows relatively equal incidence rates. So <laughs> here's a few other ways that the paradigm survives. Don't ask, don't tell. Uh, ecological fallacy, cherry pick the data, drop female violence from the analysis, <laughs> and then the crime data problem, and evidence by citation. Don't ask, don't tell. Um, <coughs> you do surveys of women's victimization and men's perpetration. Um, initially, the only government survey, Violence Against Women survey, uh, was presented as a survey of criminal victimization of women. Although men were included in the sample, they were told this is a study of criminal victimization of women. So it puts filters on that survey. Um, it's cited as evidence for male violence, and here we have uh, Murray's 1999 presentation showing it's only 1 16th uh, as much as with the CTS surveys. So <coughs> violence against women surveys generate very low baseline reports of victimization, but show a gender difference in victimization rates because women define criminal victimization differently than men do, on a, especially on a survey against women. There's the actual rates that they found in this one, 0.03 and 1.1, <coughs> very low baseline rates. But then the way this is frequently cited is that males are three times as violent as females. But of course, the, the baseline incidence rate is very, very low because it has this filter on it. Um, OK. Now, the other thing, of course, is that with incidence data, they're typically seen and interpreted as unilateral victimization, although we'll take a look at that one. So for example, if we get repeat severe violence reported by 8% of US women, the question becomes, are these women all battered women? Um, repeat severe male perpetrated violence is what we typically would call battering. Wife battering is this type of violence perpetrated by the male. What would husband battering be? Um, <coughs> how about the use of severe violence against a nonviolent man? Would that be husband battering? Um, what about bilateral violence of equal severity? How, what, how would we call that? So here's some reality check uh, data that we throw in here to reality check for the paradigm. Um, this is the Stetson Strauss study where they looked at the 1985 US national survey data um, and a very large samples. You see here 5,005 married couples, 526 dating couples, and 237 cohabiting couples. And when the violence was reported on this survey, 10% of the married couples uh, reporting and 13% of the cohabiting couples reported females using severe violence when the male partner was nonviolent. Okay, so it can't possibly be self-defense. I mean, self-defense against what? Um, so this would be sort of the husband battering measure. And then the wife battering measure, the reverse pattern, which is the woman using severe violence against the nonviolent male was six or seven percent. Here's the actual table. Um, you know, and I've done workshops where I've had uh, police officers and other people look at this table really in uh, disbelief. And the, what you want to look at here are these two middle columns right here, because they <coughs> compare male severe, uh, severe violence by a male against a nonviolent female. It's that column right there. So that's wife battering with severe violence by a female against a nonviolent male. And you see the numbers are higher. Now, you know, there's still a question we haven't got to yet. 
and that is, is the male violence more severe than the female violence? We'll get to that one, because I, I would say there, there probably are some cases that are gender irreversible that involve hostage taking, repeated violence, et cetera. I've worked as an expert witness in some of these cases, and, but I think Murray made this, the point yesterday that these really horrific um, headline-grabbing cases are probably about one half of one percent of all cases, but they're the ones that get the most attention. But he, here, as we're looking at se severe violence against a nonviolent other, we see that the female perpetration uh, goes beyond the male perpetration. There's the famous <coughs> study that uh, John Archer did in the Psychological Bulletin in 2000. It was a meta-analytic study, so it combined all, a, a number of studies, put them all together into one huge study, uh, and one combined analysis gets a sample size of over 64,000 in the sample, and it calculates a measure called D prime, which estimates the uh, difference size in terms of standard deviation. In other words, if the male violence is more than the female violence, D prime tells you, in terms of a standard deviation, how much more it is. So D prime of one is one standard deviation uh, in the distribution of male scores over and above the female scores. Um, <coughs> and that's what the data look like. You see there's huge numbers up here. Huge, and the effect size is minus 0.05, which meant that the female violence was slightly more frequent across, summed across all these studies than was the, female, the, than was the male violence. There was a rejoinder written about this too, which said the same thing, that it, it didn't look at context. Um, also, here's the injury data. W women are injured more, but the effect size is one-sixth of a standard deviation, and the medical treatment uh, effect size is smaller than that. So this was <coughs> a large and very important finding. <coughs> okay, more recently, uh, Whitaker et al. Uh, did this study for Center for Disease Control, U.S. National Survey, uh, large sample again, over 11,000. 18 to 28 year olds, and then it's part of the National Longitudinal Study on Adolescent Health. 24% uh, of the people reported some intimate partner violence using this, the CTS2. Uh, of those, half reported reciprocal violence, match for level of severity. The ones that were unilateral, 70% of the perpetrators were female, and most female injury resulted from the reciprocal uh, intimate partner violence. Uh, again, uh, you know, uh, n departing somewhat from the stereotypic view of wife battering. Um, <coughs> Whitaker said uh, this, that regarding injury, men were more likely to inflict injury than were women, and reciprocal intimate partner violence was associated with greater injury than non-reciprocal. So, I mean, obviously you get the, the, the non-reciprocal as well, but there's just different patterns that are emerging. It's not one size fits all. So the conclusion of those incident studies would be the most common form of intimate partner violence is mutual violence, so there probably is more work for marital therapists who are coming at this more from a, uh, a couple's point of view. The second most common form is, would be female perpetrated, and the third most common form would be male perpetrated. Um, it's not just reporting, because it doesn't matter what the gender is of the person doing the reporting, you get the same results. And so <clears throat> there's the data from 1989. There's the data from 2007. <clears throat> Both based on large representative surveys. Are you talking violence? Are you talking reciprocal violence on emotional violence? Yeah, we're talking uh, conflict <laughs> tactic scale measures here. Yeah. If you get into emotional violence, it's still pretty equivalent, but the rates get really high. I mean, it's like they got up around 50% or something like that. So there's some limitations with that initial position, one being the higher than expected uh, level of female violence, uh, the level of female violence against nonviolent males, which means it's probably not self-defense, lesbian violence, and the male, that male dominance is not the norm. And in fact, only 2% of males think it's okay to hit their wife, so it's, it's not normatively accepted. Um, the reaction to it was that the CTS surveys were criticized, um, uh, reporting out of context uh, that where women were, reported, were exposed to more instrumental forms of violence 
and also argued that male violence was qualitatively different. Um, that generally meant uh, instrumental as opposed to defensive. Now, <coughs> this is the Canadian General Social Survey, and uh, uh, Denny LaRoche. Denny, are you here? Stand up and take a bow. Stand up and take a bow. This is Denny LaRoche, who uh, had a, <laughs> a lot of courage. Had a lot of courage, put his job on the line to analyze these data, and, and working in a government setting that was was politically really sort of leaning in another direction. Um, but he he stood up and told the truth. And 26,000 respondents split by gender, um, and in this particular study, the crime victim filter was dropped. The focus was on perceptions of crime, and in addition, they added a scale that measured the use of violence for control. Okay, so we could get into the instrumental measures of violence. And first of all, found that 8% of all Canadian women reported uh, five-year uh, incidents of victimization of violence, and 7% of men reported being physically abused at least once in the last five years. And here we get to the question of instrumentality, because there was this control scale built into the survey so now you can measure intimate terrorism the way Michael Johnson described it, except that he never, in his original writing, talked about female intimate terrorism. And we talked about male intimate terrorism. So this is repeat severe instrumental violence by the partner, which was picked up in this survey and was reported by 2.6% of men as vi being victimized by it and 4.2% of women. And that comes from the Canadian General Social Survey data uh, in 2004. So another way of putting it is to say about 96% of men and over 97% of women say they don't use instrumental intimate violence or that it was not used against them. So then the question is, why is gender given the weight that it is if the overwhelming percentage of each gender says these things are not happening? Um, now, there may be some stereotypical cases of intimate partner violence that are not reversible, but how small a minority of cases are they? And are our po policies really sort of drift net approaches to these particular cases? Um, and the instrumental use of intimate partner violence that came out of the Canadian Social Survey uh, contradicts this feminist view that female violence is all for self-defense. Now, uh, again, I'll go over this kind of quickly because we sort of showed it yesterday, but uh, De Kessarady did a survey in Canada, they found 90, 90, sorry, 62.3% of women said their violence was never in self-defense. 6.9% said it always was in self-defense. And what was his conclusion? Female violence was self-defensive. I actually had to put his data and his conclusion side by side in rethinking domestic violence because otherwise people wouldn't have believed me if I had reported it this way. Um, and he's, he, anyway, so mistakes occur. Um, I found in Rethinking Domestic Violence, the question is when these mistakes are occurring repeatedly, time after time after time, are they still mistakes? You'll see that in Rethinking Domestic Violence. All the, all the mistakes that were made were in the same direction. They were all made in the direction of the gender paradigm. Um, on the self-defense issue, Diane Fallingstad did, a, this is admittedly an undergraduate uh, sample, in South Carolina, asking them about assault experiences, uh, 115 said they'd been victimized by a partner. Perceptions of the assaulters and their own motivations were assessed and came out to be like this. A greater percentage of women than men report using aggression to feel more powerful, to get control over the other person, <coughs> or to punish the person for wrong behavior. Um, not a lot of self-defense. Uh, the Douglas and Strauss study, that, the cross-cultural study that was done with university students, the college student sample originally published on 19 countries, a huge sample size. Again, the average female partner violence was 21% higher than male partner violence. Again, as we get into uh, the university populations selected, but as we get into younger populations, we're finding this increase. Um, <coughs> this was a National Institute of Justice study on coercive control that Mary Ann Dutton, no, we were never married, we're not related, but uh, um, Mary Ann did this study with Lisa Goodman, found equal coercive control by gender. And uh, there's a paper out by Felsen on the same kind of thing, um, looking at coercive control 
in a sample that included both males and females of victimization by coercive control equal by gender. And uh, Martin Fiebert kept this sort of running tally, and this is a study that he did back in uh, 1997. 29 percent of the sample of college-age women in California reported initiating assaults, um, initiating assaults on their male, male partner. Bland and Orn found it was 73.4 percent, Stetson Strauss 52. Uh, and here's one we'll come back to. If we go into a male treatment group, it turns out that 40 percent of the female partners of the men in treatment said they hit him first. Okay. Uh, now, you know, the point can be made well, the first blow might be minor and what follows might be a huge disproportionate retribution. Um, but here we see who fights back. Again, Stetson Strauss, if assaulted by the partner, 25% of women fight back, 15% of men hit back. Um, here's the ecological fallacy issue. This involves drawing <coughs> male populations from court-mandated treatment groups uh, and female populations from transition houses and then generalizing to the entire population um, without mentioning the selection factors that make these distinct populations. Uh, a couple of books on custody assessment do this. Jaffe, Lemon, and uh, Poisson, I think that is, um, generalized from a transition house sample. Uh, Lundy Bancroft generalized from a male transition house sample and then drew conclusions about the impact of gender on custody assessments a highly sensitive issue, uh, custody assessment, sort of leading the person who reads the book to think that the batterer is going to be male in every case based on uh, these particular samples. So there's something called the ecological fallacy. So you cite a self-selected sample and then generalize to the society as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and here you have those particular books. And both books use the word he as equivalent to batterer throughout and she as equivalent to victim. So this is what Kahneman and Tversky, uh, Sarah Demaray made this point yesterday, they call this a representative heuristic, that is batterers have the attributes of maleness and they alone po will pose a risk to the child. Um, <clears throat> and then both books also suggest that if the woman's battered, the children will be too and cite a 40% overlap of wife and child abuse. Um, there's no mention of the possibility of female spouse abuse or child abuse in either book. Jaffe dismisses violence towards men in one paragraph as qualitatively different. <coughs> they warn the, the, also, they warn the assessor, now that the assessor's primed to think that the risk of the child is gonna be from a male and a male batterer, then he takes the next step, that is expect the batterer to deny. And if somebody denies, then that's then taken in a kind of causal flip-flop as proof for the fact that they're probably a batterer, which I call the blueprint for a witch hunt. Because, you know, if women used to drown in the old days, it's, well, okay, she wasn't a witch. Uh, if she walked on water, she was. Well, if he denies it now, then he's probably a batterer. And then this material, to make it worse, is part of the training package given to judges who have to make these decisions. So if you look at the State Justice Institute Navigating Custody and Visitation Evaluations, Cases with Domestic Violence, a Judge's Guide. Uh, this is what they're being given to read. Um, National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges gets the same stuff to read. Ken Corvo and I are just starting to work on some papers now about professional education. Here's the reality check. The actual overlap of physical wife and, wife and child abuse is 6% not 40%. If you go to the source for this, which is Appel and Holden, um, you find that the 40% was for transition house samples, but when you get out into community samples, it drops to 6% and occurs mainly on the least violent uh, items like slapped. Um, so <clears throat> the question then is, what are the real risk sources for children? Here's a study that McDonald, Jareel et al. did, came out just in 2006. 1,615 dual parent households, the main focus is on exposure to violence, um, but reports violence by severity and gender of the perpetrator. It uses a multi-stage probability sample, has a good response rate, 85%. Pretty good study. Here's the sort of key findings down here. Uh, any violence at all, male to female, 13.7, female to male, 18.2, severe violence, male to female, 3.6, 
female to male 7.5. Uh, this is what children were being exposed to in the McDonald study, uh, more violence by women. What they concluded was this. One, having children is a risk factor for inter intimate partner violence. The presence of children upped the rate amongst couples from 59 per, uh, to 59% from 41%. Secondly, children were more exposed to violence from mothers, uh, 4.3 exposed to severe male to, to female violence, 11.4 severe female violence to male violence. This is a <coughs> huge study. Health Canada did 135,573 child maltreatment investigations conducted by the National Clearinghouse uh, in Family Violence, published by them and conducted by Health Canada. The data again tell a very different story from that presented in the paradigmatic studies by Jaffe and Bancroft. Um, designates the abuse type, breaks it down, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, emotional maltreatment in multiple categories. Published, uh, Trachme et al. are the, uh, public, the uh, editors here. And biological mothers were more likely substantiated perpetrator of physical abuse, neglect, emotional maltreatment, and multiple categories. Biological fathers are more likely perpetrator of sexual abuse. And those are the numbers for the substantiated. And that means through uh, an investigation, this whole question of substantiation is a big issue. Uh, I'll come back to that because some people will substantiate something. Janet Johnson did a great job. She did a study in 2005 where she substantiated allegations by taking it right through the court, seeing what the judge said. But you, you read other things like some of the papers on the ABA website, substantiation means a report was made to the police unilaterally, but not corroborated. Yes, sir. They were, yeah, they were physically present. And they, you know, the, you can argue that the women were there more, but yes. Oh, I mean, that was like, I mean, a lot of these women are single moms with kids, so I don't think there's anybody who not, was not a lot of them. Not a lot of them were. Not a lot of them were. Um, here's uh, the U.S. Now, I thought that was the biggest sample ever, but the, actually the U.S. survey was bigger still. The sample size here is 718,000. Um, and for 2004, 57.8% of the perpetrators were women, 42.4% were men. Um, and here were the types of maltreatment that they found in this survey. 62.4% um, of the victims experienced neglect uh, and the other, all kinds of maltreatment going on here. And this is their report, the victim by parental status uh, for all kinds of abuse, mother only was 40.8, um, father only was 18.8, uh, 18 point as opposed to 40.8. I mean, the point being here that you don't just look at the father as the one risk to the child. Um, here's a victim by perpetrator relationship, mother only 38.8, father only 18.3, mother and father both 18.3, and that's across all forms of child abuse. Uh, if you go to fatalities, uh, mother only, is, mother is the perpetrator of child fatalities 30.5% of the time, the father 18.2, mother and father 20.4. So if you're assessing risk, you definitely want to look both directions, yes. Is there any possible link there to the minimal factor? <sighs> <laughs> you know what, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, that was about 40 tables in. Um, <coughs> Um, okay, so that just summarizes the data that we just looked at. Now, um, uh, just comparing that to the, the APA guidelines for forensic assessment and Wiseman and Debeau says this, if you're doing a custody assessment, which is a forensic assessment for the courts, forensic evaluation has to begin with a cognitive set and evaluative attitude of the assessor that's neutral, objective, and detached. You have to set up contrasting hypotheses and say, how did the data fit this way? How did the data fit that way? You cannot come at it from a gender paradigm, which is what's being provided by the Jaffe and Bancroft books. You can't, get, you can't create that kind of mindset. It, I think, contradicts the ethical guidelines for a forensic assessment. Okay, cherry-picked data. Um, Barbara Morse reported data from the U.S. National Youth Survey. That's a longitudinal study, a longitudinal survey of self-reported problem behaviors 
national probability sample, 1,725 respondents. They keep coming back to this group. It's a peer group, 83, 86, 89, 92. They came back again, and they're getting them to report all kinds of problem behavior. They find that the female to male violence rate and severe violence rate was about double the rate of male to female violence. And again, that didn't matter whether it was males or females that were reporting. Um, for example, in 1992, the male severe violence uh, was reported by 13.8, sorry, female to male violence was reported by 13.8, male to female by 5.7. Uh, little or no change in the ratio over the years, slightly twice as much female initiated as male violence. Again, one of these younger samples. Um, and the frequency of severe violence by women was double that of men, used a knife or gun, four times as frequent for women. But when Morse talks about it, she says men were more likely than women to beat up their partner during the course of the year. So she picks one item off the survey. And then when you actually go into her data table, you find 2% of men beat up their partner 3.3 times, 0.9% of women beat up their partner 1.3 times. So she picks this one action uh, and generalizes it to men from 2% who are doing it. So that's an example of, sort of cherry picking the data. <laughs> and then dropping female violence from the equation is commonplace. This is a study that David Wolf and uh, Ed Gondolf, Neil Jacobson, they've all done this. They study male predictors of dating violence or recidivist violence or treatment outcome, but never assess whether a female in the couple is violent. Um, but of course, and so Wolf and Reitzel Jaffe did this uh, in a college sample to look at dating violence and dismissed female violence as being inconsequential, but Douglas and Strauss had data from the same university where they found that females in that sample were 171% as violent as the males in terms of their use of intimate partner violence, which means, no, probably not inconsequential. Gondolf, um, looked at predictors of recidivism post-treatment. Um, and in one of the footnotes, he says 60% of the women in this sample say that the man hit them first, i.e. 40% said they hit the man first. But w whether this guy's living with a, a violent woman or not is never even considered as a risk predictor. It, they're, they're all individual risk predictors based on the male client. Um, Neil Jacobson, the same thing. Uh, in his, the study at the University of Washington, which was reported as a study of male violence, cobras, and pit bulls, again in the small print uh, in the methods section, you find 40% of the partners of violent men used severe violence on the CTS, <coughs> but were not the focus of the research. Yes? Was the uh, the, the list all The only seen as victims, that's right. <coughs> that's right. Um, so yeah, same thing with this is the, uh, the Gondolf one. Um, the research questions were on the men. But it, it, this is interesting. These are the female partners of the guys in this tre of these treatment programs. 66% reported being physically aggressive toward the male partners prior to the initial arrest. 15% were also arrested when the man was. 25% were heavy drinkers, and 40% had hit the man first says Gondolf, 1996, page 39 to 40. Again, the emphasis is entirely on the men, but this is the other part of the equation. So the gender paradigm routinely routes us away from looking at those things. Um, doesn't get included in structural models used to predict uh, violence. It just gets left out of the equation. Uh, this is the Jacobson one. This was the actual quote from the methods section. According to the wives themselves, almost half would have qualified for the DV group if wife violence had been the criterion, okay? Um, but they were not. And of course, once he's selling the book on Oprah, I mean, it's the die is cast. Um, <coughs> no measures were taken on the wife's use of violence <coughs> and all independent variables focused on male violence as though it were being produced unilaterally in all these relationships, although clearly it was not 
In fact, the females in the samples use more aversive acts. There have been a number of these interaction studies done. In fact, the ones at the University of Washington were one of them, where they bring people into the lab and they break the interaction down into segments and they look at coercive and, and aversive uh, recipro reciprocal actions back and forth. And they tended to find the females in this sample used more of them. Um, so, but those kind of things just kind of went out the window. <clears throat> then we've got risk prediction. Why include females? Well, there is some really interesting work coming out of longitudinal studies that were done. These were referred to uh, the, uh, yesterday also. <clears throat> Lisa Serbin's done one. It's an ongoing study that's been done in Montreal, the Concordia longitudinal study. dates back into the 70s when these people were assessed in grade one and followed right up into adulthood. Deborah Capaldi's done one in Oregon. And they find that assorted of mating, uh, that aggressive boys and girls grow up and find each other. Um, yeah, and, and both of them found this one. They, they aggress against a male partner. So you've got, in other words, aggressive girls here assessed in grade one based on teacher's ratings. These are the ones who are most aggressive in the schoolyard. Aggressive boys, same thing. Um, and then with the aggressive girls, and they get assessed again in their teens, and then they find in their late teens that they're more likely to aggress against a male partner, and that's independent of his use of violence. Okay, so they partial out the male use of violence. They're more likely, however, to choose violent male partners, and they're also more likely to have children who make emergency room visits for injuries. So you've got this lifelong thing from grade one right up into early adulthood that's going on. Again, that argues against this notion that it's all self-defensive, gives it more of a, you know, a developmental trajectory aspect to it and argues for earlier intervention. So in other words, why not include uh, females in risk prediction studies? It's been ruled out as victim blaming, but that overlooks the data that say female violence may contribute to the overall uh, outcome of what's going on. Risk prediction based solely on male characteristics is actually not all that great. If you look, you try to predict uh, risk prediction using the SARA or something like that, you get a 66% accuracy rate. You know, if you flip a coin, you get a 50% accuracy rate. A perfect accuracy rate is one. So in other words, you're, you've moved a quarter of the way from chance to perfection when you just base it on that one person. <coughs> I was supposed to give a talk in Chicago where I was, you know, they really wanted me to come give a talk on risk prediction and they were begging me to do it and I, so I sent the PowerPoints down making this point, they canceled the talk the next day. <laughs> um, we haven't got to that part yet. <clears throat> the crime data problem, okay. Um, a lot of these things are based on criminal samples and there's a lot of selection factors that go on with criminal samples. Police reports skew gender differences First of all, because males don't call as frequently as women do. Uh, depending which study you read, it's somewhere from a third to a tenth. Stetson Strauss said females call ten times as frequently. Uh, Denny LaRoche found 6% uh, of males calling, 16% of females calling. But then even when the police are called, they're less likely to arrest a female. Um, Males call less because they're less likely to be taken seriously by police. There's two major studies on that, one in Canada by Grant Brown, one in the U.S. by Ibuzawa. Um, Brown found even injured males were unlikely to have female perpetrators uh, arrested. He looked at 2,044 cases of domestic violence <coughs> to the Edmonton police. And when the male was injured, the female was charged 60% of the time. When the female was injured, the man was charged 90% of the time. Um, when the male called but was not injured, the female was charged 13.2% of the time. Female called but was not injured, the male was charged 52.5% of the time. So these selection factors go on with police samples. And then when you see things based on the criminal justice system data, that's where you get to these 85, 95% numbers. But again, they're overlooking the self-selection factors around calling and the police responding, et cetera. Okay, and then there's <coughs> the data inflation problem. Um, certain items will inflate rates of violence against women. Um, Neil Gilbert, for example, at Berkeley, talks about Mary Koss's uh, use of this item, attempted unwanted sex, okay, uh, and a measure of rape. Attempted unwanted sex. Now, what could that be? That could be a lot of things, couldn't it? I mean, it could be attempted and stopped, 
but it still was unwanted and it was still was attempted. She used that in a measure of uh, campus rape. And according to her statistics, you would project 3,000 rapes a year at Berkeley. Um, 40 to 80 women come to see the rape counseling center at Berkeley and two report to the police. Even though rape is underreported, uh, it's a long way from 40 to 80 at the rape counseling center to get up to 3,000. When you include this item, it really uh, inflates the, the statistic. Um, and then when CASAS victims were asked directly, what happened, 73 percent who'd had this attempted unwanted sex said they didn't believe they'd been raped. Sorry about the typo there. 40, 42 percent uh, had sex later with the man who'd raped them. And, and then the latest CDC report, which just came out this month, included this item as a measure of intimate partner violence. And so now all of a sudden, violence against women is higher than violence against men, which Whitaker et al. found in the last CDC report. It's got this item, threatened, attempted, or completed physical violence or unwanted sex. So you've got attempted unwanted sex. It doesn't tell you how much this contributes to the overall measure of intimate partner violence because they're all lumped together. Um, so, you know, I think this is a kind of a, a data padding uh, type of issue. So here you get the reaction to that. Now, the, and I was talking about the sort of corroboration issue. The ABA website uses reports to police as a true measure of incidents of domestic violence, even though, uh, even in custody cases. <coughs> but um, uh, certainly not all reports to police are corroborated. And in Janet Johnson's study, it was just a percentage of them that were corroborated in court by a judge. So, you know, is this just a mistake? Well, you know, in rethinking domestic violence, we, uh, I went through 47 out of 47 studies that made these same methodological mistakes all in the same direction. So this is how a paradigm, the snowball effect of a paradigm happens. And zero out of 47 made errors in the opposite direction. And so <coughs> um, if you look at a violence distribution according to the paradigm, this is the way it should look. This is male violence over here. Okay, males are more likely Females are less likely to be violent. There's a little bit of overlap in its self-defense. That's what the paradigm uh, suggests. If you look at the actual stats, it looks more like this. You know, they're just way more similar. Um, in other words, the paradigm's not really supported by the data. And you get this <coughs> issue of evidence by citation. Uh, Kessarady cites Jaffe, cites Dobash, cites Gondolf, then they all cite each other. And then <coughs> the ABA website cites the APA website, which cites the National Ju Judicial Training Institute on the issue of abuse of men seeking and getting sole custody. We've never been able to find a single empirical study on that. Clinically, many of us believe that's true, but there's no data that generically it happens. And so they all sort of cite each other. We can't find the beef. We can't find the empirical data to, uh, to in indicate that that is, in fact, true. Um, so then there's, you know, these are the spins that get put on the data. There's the sample questions sometimes are biased. There's this ecological fallacy with the selected samples get generalized to an entire population. The data get cherry picked, and then the cherry picked data are the ones that are emphasized. The data get misreported, even one's own data. This is probably the most egregious example. The female violence is not measured in, or included in prediction studies, even though it's possible that it might be contributing. And then you get um, citation circles where author A cites author B, cites author C, and this is cited as evidence, but you've never actually got to the evidence. And now you have paradigm journals. And par violence against women, although to the credit of violence against women, they did published an article by Murray Strauss, which was definitely not a paradigm article. Um, now, so you start to look at the impact of this, and if you ask police or psychologists or the general public, um, they all now begin to view the same action, if it's committed by a male, as more likely to be abusive than the same action committed by a female. And there have been some empirical studies that have been done on this. Um, Police arrest statistics and what follows from arrests severely underestimate female aggression. 
and in court mandated or psychoeducational groups, if a man comes in and says, hey, my partner's violent too, then he's told he's victim blaming. They don't actually go and ask the partner, are you violent too? Uh, and we used to ask the partner if she was violent too, and some of them were, and we would still say to the man, okay, but you're still responsible for your part of the violence, okay? So, uh, in fact, we had one man quit one of our groups because he didn't think he could stop being violent with the female partner he was with. So he dropped out of treatment two weeks early to leave the relationship, to move to another town. He was treated as a treatment dropout. I thought of him as a treatment success. Um, <laughs> So, so you have this paradigm perseverance. As research still finds males more violent than females, always is typically based on court-mandated treatment or transition house samples, routinely overlooks the fact that the criminal justice system disproportionately is called more by female victims, responds more aggressively, and arrests males more frequently. So then you get this sort of one-size-fits-all notion that police arrests, victim services, court policies, and psychoeducational intervention are all based on the 5.7% in the Stets and Strauss data table, married males and 7.3% of cohabiting males who use severe violence against their wives. That's the stereotype, is that rather small group um, when you compare it to all the other forms of violence that are going on. Uh, what about all the other ones? Well, they, they get underreported. Okay, so now we have a new reality check. <clears throat> I just want to tell you a bit more about these longitudinal studies. What's coming next is we better start paying serious attention to female violence because it is on the upswing. Um, you get into younger samples, you find that young women are more violent than young men. Uh, it's, this is predictable from their developmental pro trajectories. And here's at least... Uh, Four different large sample studies that have found this. Marion Ehrensaf doing her work in New York, Deborah Capaldi in Oregon, uh, the Douglas and Strauss Dating Violence Survey in 37 countries, Terry Moffat's work, uh, and Lynn Magdahl, the work in the Dunedin, New Zealand sample, uh, all found, by the way, not only this developmental trajectory, but found that personality disturbance was a more important predictor than gender. Um, and personality disorders or disturbances are now found to be the main predictor of, of intimate partner violence. Uh, Marion Aronsoff said this. Terry Moffat talked about negative emotionality. Uh, and longitudinal studies by Capaldi and Serban suggest that there's this long-term issue. Here's the Concordia study. It started back in 76. Um, aggressive children in both sexes, the ones who were more aggressive had lower IQs, lower academic achievement than comparison controls. Both were more aggressive during play. The girls' aggression was associated with a preference for male partners who were also aggressive. As they moved into adolescence, the aggressive girls had elevated rates of smoking, alcohol, and illicit drug use, and according to the authors, continued to seek out behaviorally compatible peer groups probably comprised of boys and girls with similar aggressive or pre-delinquent behavioral styles. The aggressive group had elevated levels of depression and anxiety disorder by their late teens. When they married, their children had higher health risks and the aggressive girls had become aggressive mothers exhibiting maternal childhood aggression and having children who had more visits to the emergency room specifically for treatment of injuries indicates that these women will, be, uh, will select aggressive men and contribute to the intracouple aggression. This is the notion of assortative mating. Deborah Capaldi found the same thing in Oregon. Okay, so the Concordia study was not an anomaly. All of these studies have found longitudinal peer cohort data where female violence exceeds male violence. They all found that female adult uh, intimate partner violence was predictable from earlier factors, violence or personality disorder. Um, so the conclusions of these studies are like this, that you know, intimate partner violence is roughly equal by gender with younger samples. It's on the upswing more with males. Females are hurt more often, but as we pointed out yesterday, they're not the exclusive victims. It's not true that males are more controlling. There are now two or three studies uh, on this particular issue. And it's not necessarily the case that domestic violence will escalate if it's uh, 
left unchecked. In fact, there's a number of different patterns that go on. Bilateral, female perpetrated. The male domination, unfortunately, gave us a one-size-fits-all stereotype. It doesn't represent the majority of intimate partner violence cases. Um, in fact, in, in some ways, it's, a, it's, it's obviously serious, and we want to take them very seriously, and the existing laws allow us to do that. Um, but it's not the only game in town, and we, we need to be more aware, have a more diversified view of what's going on. <coughs> um, males, one more thing on personality disorder. Males convicted of spouse assault have very high incidences of personality disorder. This was found in all studies up to one that Ed Gondolf did, but where all of the uh, social desirability measures were off the chart. I think these guys were faking good because they didn't want to be seen as having personality disorder. But, you know, in eight or nine other studies, there's high levels of personality disturbance, at least. Typically, it's either antisocial or borderline. Uh, the antisocial guys that will use violence in almost any circumstance, including with their partner. The borderline guys who have impulse control problems attached to attachment and intimacy issues. And now we're finding females convicted of spouse assault have the same personality disorder peaks. <coughs> Jerry Moffat found that, Lynn Magdal, uh, Henning's work has found the same thing, borderline issues in convicted females, three times higher than with males. Uh, the work we did on males focused on borderline personality organization, insecure attachment, exposure to trauma. These, these things contributed to an abusive personality. Um, which led to intimate partner violence in a large subsample of men who were in treatment for spouse assault. Uh, a recent study by Mauricio confirmed this finding where they found the same connection of attachment problems crystallizing into personality disorders and then being played out as intimate partner violence. In fact, there's now a half dozen studies finding the same kind of thing. Uh, Henning, Jones, and Holford found <coughs> women uh, in intimate partner violence treatment five times as likely as males to have borderline personality issues. And a study by Hughes et al. in a sample, 103 court-mandated women. Borderline features, are, again, were associated with intimate partner violence. Yes? The, the question is, have there been any studies on the use of Marshall Linehan's dialectical behavior therapy? Um, there has, you know, the, the one that got started was being done in Long Island in New York. It's a, the first study I knew of that was combining DBT and CBT. And it was starting to, sh to show some promising results. Jill Rathus was doing it, but she uh, had to take a maternity break. And so the, da the data are not completely in yet, as far as I know. Uh, although I've, <coughs> it, I've done workshops where I've talked about blended behavioral therapy incorporating some elements of DBT into work that we do, CBT work that we do with abusive men, because I think there is a case for, uh, I think DBT has a lot of things to offer in that kind of work. And I think we need an expanded focus working with uh, assault of people that includes attachment issues, that includes exposure to trauma, you know, includes some of these other things that haven't traditionally been focused on. Um, this is the Terry Moffitt's work, the uh, the Dunedin study is now referred to. It was done in a town in New Zealand where they had a, a peer cohort, started really young, followed these people through their teenage years and into their early adulthood, uh, found similarities. In fact, uh, Terry Moffat wrote it up uh, called Gender, Gender Differences in Antisocial Behavior. She concluded that there were more similarities than there were uh, differences uh, looking at the boys and girls who became antisocial. But she focused on this thing she called negative emotionality. And if you read it, it's, you know, it came from this Tellingen uh, multidimensional personality questionnaire. It's sort of a little blend of borderline-like things, this catastrophizing, overreacting to stress, et cetera, and with uh, sort of a little dose of cynicism and maybe even paranoia creeping into the rest of the, the scale. Um, but <coughs> attitudes towards aggression, when someone hurts me, I try to get even. Um, and I get irritated at little annoyances. So she, they found this person, at which cut across gender, this, this negative emotionality issue. There's 49 items, so these are just uh, you know, a subsample of four. was very predictive, and you can kind of see it coming. Again, sort of you know, indicating earlier intervention, if we can do it. Uh, if you measure net NEM in women at age 15, it predicts their use of violence toward intimate and other at age 21, regardless of whether the other person fights back. Okay, 
Um, so six years down the line. And then antisocial personality uh, disorder in mothers. Uh, Julia Kim Cohen at Yale has published data on this relationship um, uh, showing that there are more behavioral problems in children whose mothers have antisocial personality disorder. And <coughs> Lisa Serban found something the, uh, the same in her uh, long-term study at Concordia. So again, you know, when we look now at personality disorders, we're starting to finally pay more attention to these things. It's coming from a number of different sources. Um, Marion Aronsoff really concluded that personality disorders were a kind of uh, a failure of teenage problems to resolve. They wound up with these people who kind of went on, you know, like in, when you're 17, everybody's a borderline sort of thing. But by the time you get to 27, you're expected to have grown out of it. And with some of these people, that's not going on. And she's finding that this happens and it's relevant to custody because there's research showing that the presence of a personality disorder in either parent relates to both externalizing and internalizing behaviors uh, in the children. So, you know, our current view of intimate partner violence based kind of on a social psychological model called groupthink or group polarization along gender group lines where initially we go back to Catherine McKinnon's Marxist view of this, which is a Manichaean view, right? Because there's two groups. There's the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. There's males and females, two groups, in group, out group, good guys, bad guys. I always have a problem with these two group categories. There are two kinds of people in the world. People who use two group categories and those that don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and so the males are the out group, and so they're seen as being more violent, controlling, warlike. The most extreme examples will be generalized to the entire group. The most extreme examples are bad. Nobody's saying that they're not. They are bad. Um, you know, they commit mayhem. They're horrible to be around. We need to make the world safer for those particular guys. To say all males are like that is just flat out wrong. Females are the in group, a gentle, nonviolent. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, let me, whoops. All right, so <laughs> this is a group polarization. What happens is if you get a group of like-minded people together to talk about a social problem or a policy that comes from that problem, if they're like-minded to begin with, then <laughs> the group will become more and more extreme as it talks about the problem. Initially, this was called the risky shift because it was set up in the, in that particular venue of creating decision-making problems. But later on, it wasn't, they found it wasn't just a risky shift. It's what groups do <laughs> when there's no dissent in the group. And the way you gain status in a group like that is to be a little bit more extreme than anybody else in the group in the direction the group's already leaning. Um, now, this is a, a commonplace function in uh, groups that have uh, a particular bent, uh, lean in a certain direction becomes a problem when we form policy based on this. Uh, there's a group schema that develops. It's a complex of ideas. Information begins to shift to the extreme. It becomes dogma. It becomes ideology. This becomes the new social reality. Uh, people say, oh yeah, it's got to be that way. There's <laughs> informational influence provided within this framework. Social psychologists have been studying this stuff since the 50s. And then groupthink is when a group has to develop uh, a position under some sort of perceived threat. And that perceived threat can be whatever they think the outgroup is doing to them. And so the, here's the definition of groupthink that Irving Janus <coughs> did in his original study in 1972 based on US foreign policy decisions. And he contrasted the Bay of Pigs, which was a bad decision, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was a good decision. You know, I, I don't know if the rest of you remember us all being taught. Maybe I'm the only one old enough to remember ducking under the school desks. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, ducking under the school. We didn't want to have to do that, right? All right, so Janice was contrasting the good and bad decision-making. And JFK, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, took groups. He gave them opposing uh, working assumptions and got them to report back and evolved the strategy out of having these opposing groups report back. Instead of having one big group with one set of assumptions where groupthink develops. Um, and so, you know, this is basically one of the things that we need, <coughs> we need to avoid in policy work is 
this kind of group think. You get a cohesive in-group, striving for unanimity. It overrides motivation to realistically appraise alternative courses of action. Um, then we wind up with what we might have. Um, and highly cohesive group, selected for unanimity. The selection factor is really important here. I mean, there are people with dissenting opinions who simply get disinvited. I mean, isn't it amazing Murray Strauss, who's the number one researcher, hasn't done any work for the government in 20 some odd years? I mean, what does that tell you about groupthink in, a, in, in action? Uh, insulation from independent judgments. Uh, <clears throat> you know, there's an APA, American Psychological Associations, having a meeting in Washington later this month that, where they've been very careful to insulate themselves from any independent judgments. Thank you. Um, perceived threat or injustice, um, certainly, you know, and Aaron Pitsy will be talking about this this afternoon, the, the history of the women's movement, there really was a very viable issue. I remember the age of denial when family violence was just shuffled under the rug and nobody talked about it. Of course there was a threat. Of course there was something bad going on. And people began to do something about it. But a lot of the ones who came in and the sort of first tier, like Aaron Pitsy, got shunted aside because they had independent judgments. And so the group kept redefining itself and becoming more extreme. Here's some of the symptoms. The group sees themselves as invulnerable. They see themselves as morally superior. Um, and there's a self-censorship from uh, that generates a sense of apparent consensus. And then that means the world is seen as being absolutely right. <coughs> Self-appointed mind guards to protect the group from adverse information. So <coughs> if you get an activist group with a predetermined direction and it confers an isolation from dissenting views, <coughs> then status is gained from taking more extreme positions in the predetermined direction within that group. People who have strong needs for dominance will advance to more extreme positions in the group in order to gain status, power, and control in the group. And these traits will then be projected onto the outgroup, like battering is all about power and control, but activism isn't. Actually, if you look at, <laughs> right, actually, if you, if, if you look at the original <coughs> works that McClellan did on power and control, you find out almost everything's about power and control, including stamp collecting including women who get into fist fights over who's going to be Richard Ramirez's girlfriend. That's about power and control because you're affiliating yourself with a notorious, nefarious outlaw. There's a power and control thing there. So this whole sort of use of the, the concept of power and control as though it only applied to batterers is simply not true. It's much broader than that. It's part of the human condition. Unfortunately, we obviously have to find better ways of dealing with power over other people and find people how to re teach people how to redefine power needs. <coughs> so this activist group then forms a paradigm explanation for domestic violence. And then through uh, legal means, lawsuits against police, uh, forces who fail to arrest violent men. And I think, by the way, police should arrest violent men. But the problem, of course, is the threat of lawsuits means they're really arresting a lot of people, whether they're violent or not. I mean, it strikes me as, I mean, I did a case in New Mexico last year where a woman had been trying to get help from a police department in a small town um, repeatedly from her ex-husband who was stalking her, coming back to the house, um, threatening her, et cetera. She couldn't get help. Uh, he would leave. The police would show up, say, well, he's not here. I've got a restraining order. We can't do anything. We didn't catch him in the act. Finally, he kills her father and her brother and injures her. <coughs> she can't get any help from the police. At the same time, David Letterman gets a restraining order against them from another woman in New Mexico who said she's coming into his house through her television set. OK? So, um, I mean, there's things going on in the system that we just really still need to kind of straighten out. Um, um, okay, political influence, domestic violence as a woman's rights issue um, at a time when no one was actually, well, I mean, there was a, not that anyone was, there were people against, against women's rights, but certainly the, the predominant sense was that, yes, women's rights, of course. I mean, politically, that was the the time to uh, 
most people were in favor of it at that particular time. And then the, took over the County Domestic Violence Council, set an agenda for court intervention, and now look after judges training and the APA and ABA views of domestic violence. Um, so some of these professional things really have to be made more sophisticated, I think. Um, this is the, the thing I'll just close with, the perception of male action. It's seen fundamental, as fundamentally different, more dangerous and abusive, even when the act is identical. This is a study that was talked about the other day. Susan Sorensen found in LA, you do this sample in four languages with 3,769 adults. They get five different vignettes and the characteristics of the victim, the assailant, and the incident are all experimentally manipulated. So you've got, you have the same incident, the same thing being done. The only thing you change is the gender. Um, and then they, they do a log analysis about this. And across vignettes, the male, male violence is seen as more likely to be illegal. Police should be called. The assailant should be arrested, should serve jail or prison time, or restraining order should be issued. Um, this is even true like for low-level uh, aspects of violence. And it's also important to note that some of the abuse used was not even physical. Um, <coughs> physical abuse was more likely perceived as illegal by women when the assailant was a man. Uh, and what they found is that there was a pretty tight social norm on male violence. People were against it. But the social norm for female violence measured through the standard deviation was much bigger. That is, there's a, just less agreement about the use of female violence. <coughs> Diane Fallingstead found out psychologists think this way too. Um, does two scenarios of psychologically abusive behaviors with the genders reversed. Gives them to 449 clinicians, 56% male. Um, and the psychologist rate, the male perpetrated behavior is more abusive than severe as the wife's use of the same actions. And these are not all physical violence, okay? They're everything. Contextual factors don't affect the tendency. Fallingstad concludes, the stereotypical association between physical aggression in males appears to extend to an association of psychological abuse in males. Um, right, it happens cross-culturally. There's data now that show <coughs> males also experience uh, extreme reactions to being traumatized. Uh, Pimlock, Kubiak, and Cortina found gender did not uh, predict differentially the effects of exposure to trauma. It was the amount of exposure to trauma that uh, affects it, not gender per se. And then uh, Sarah talked about this yesterday that people tend to underpredict female dangerousness. Um, studies that were done show that female dangerousness is kind of uh, underpredicted. So, <coughs> you know, I mean, it would be really radical to say drop gender as a central organizing worldview, <coughs> but then <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe there's better ways of looking at it. Focus on the best available evidence for risk to adults and children from intimate others. Don't rule out predictive factors. Look at everything. Find out what the best risk markers are. Ensure professionals don't have erroneous mindsets which influence their decision making on arrest and custody decisions. Develop an awareness of groupthink for all policymakers. This should be policy making 101, um, I think. I'm done. <laughs> all right. I'm done. Two minutes.